what he had to say and wanted to shut him up. I told everybody that I don't care what they say, I know that Mitch didn't do that. It's a hell of a thing, killing a man. You take away all he's got, and all he's ever gonna have. Five George K. Five George K. All increasing conditions are on ten two. Saturday, March 9, 2024. Charleston, South Carolina. The holy city, they call it mostly because of its more than 400 churches of all faiths and denominations. However, God or Mother Nature, whichever you personally choose to believe in, seemed especially angry with the holy city that day. But why Charleston? Why that specific day of all days? Well, maybe the weather gods had reason to be angry as they heaved record-shattering rain hail, gale force winds, and lightning on that historic Southern American town. But this wasn't just any storm, oh no. This weather was the likes of which haven't been seen in Charleston in nearly eight decades. Yet while first responders were busy racing back and forth all across Charleston saving lives battered by the whirlwind, quietly, almost anonymously, at a riverfront hotel, another life lay in the balance teetering between now and forever. The man's name was John Barnett. However, I'd wager to say that most of us have never heard of this Mount Shasta native-born California man. Well, until that day, that is. But what exactly brought John to this nexus of history on this particular day, in this particular city, and in that particular hotel parking lot? John spent much of his life near Seattle as a 32-year veteran of the once mighty Boeing Corporation, helping to craft some of history's greatest flying machines the world had ever flown. That is, before his retirement from the Boeing 787 factory in Charleston, South Carolina, which is the very reason John was back in town. After retiring to a little city on the bayou of Louisiana called Painville, but that Saturday in March, as the rest of the city was fleeing in search of shelter from that historic storm, John too was seeking shelter from a storm. But not that storm, that day. But a much larger vortex whose tumultuous waves have been battering him relentlessly for nearly 15 years now, finally beaching him in that touristy hotel parking lot that soggy March morning. And there, John sat alone. Well, not alone exactly, because I'm sure the tidal wave of ghosts of his painful emotional storms past and present were busy whispering in his ear, loud enough for him to hear them over the slapping rain pounding on the roof of his pumpkin orange Dodge SUV, and even above the crackling echoes of thunder that followed every bolt of lightning that snapped around him. And finally, when John decided he had had enough of the storm and could withstand the battering blows no more, well, then John made a fateful decision. But still, that question hung in the air heavier than the storm clouds above. Why there, in the 1960s era hotel parking lot? I'm sure it wasn't the weather that day. After all, John spent more years in Seattle where there are more dreary rain-filled days than there are coffee shops. We may never know for sure. Apparently, dear John wrote down some words for those who loved him most. Then once John finished putting pen to paper, John, well, John did a thing. Or did he? You can't keep getting away with this! You can't keep getting away with it!
No, I don't claim to know John, not by any means. I only came to know of him when the news of his death broke along with many of you. But if you clicked on the thumbnail looking for some juicy tinfoil hat conspiracy theories about mercenaries or ninja hitmen hired by Boeing, or how scenes may have been staged to look like one thing or another, well, I'm sorry, but this isn't the place for that. Not today. Oh, Boeing did it. And by it, I'm sure we're all thinking the quiet part, you know, the quiet part sometimes you can't say out loud. But don't worry, we'll get to Boeing later. But I've devoted so much time to the disaster that has become Boeing that I wanted to begin with the man. You know, that man that may or may not have done that thing on that rainy day in Charleston. All I know about John is what I've read on the internet and social media, and we'll get to that soon too. But I know one thing for sure. If John did have any skeletons in his closet, we'd have heard about it by now. But by all accounts, John or Mitch was loved and loved in return even deeper. According to reporter Eva Herskowitz of the Post and Courier, Barnett was born in Mount Shasta, California. Described by John's brother Rodney as a tiny town on the flanks of a snow-capped volcano. Official records say John now makes, or made, his retirement home in Pineville, Louisiana, about 125 miles northwest of the Red Stick City, Baton Rouge. After Mount Shasta, John settled in what he, I'm sure, imagined was going to be a career of a lifetime working for Boeing in Seattle. And by all accounts, he almost did. Almost. In his 32-year career at Boeing, John began as an electrician to none other than the Queen of the Skies herself, the magnificent Boeing 747, at its Everett Washington factory. After that, as Dominic Gates of the Seattle Times reports, John then worked his way up to quality inspector, then manager, and at every stop along the way. John had never had anything less than top-class ratings in his performance reviews. In his statement after John's tragic loss, his attorneys Turkowitz and Knowles said Barnett was a brave, honest man of the highest integrity. He cared dearly about his family, his friends, the Boeing company, his Boeing co-workers, and the pilots and people who flew on the aircraft. We have rarely met someone with a more sincere and forthright character, they said. The statement went on to say that Barnett was in very good spirits and really looking forward to putting this phase of his life behind him and moving on. We didn't see any indication he would take his own life. No one can believe it. They said we are all devastated. And in closing, they said that the Charleston police must investigate this fully and accurately and let the public know what they find out. Meanwhile, Barnett's niece, Caitlin Gillespie, called him the fun uncle of the family. She said John Barnett was into dirt track car racing. and he even got her into racing with him. But she said lately he was stressed and depressed by the latest flood of quality problems at Boeing and by the strain of his case against the company for harassing him and forcing him from his job. Interesting choice of words, a flood. Because indeed it was. Nevertheless, she said John was the most selfless person in private life and in his legal campaign against Boeing. He was suing the company not for money, but to help save lives, she said. And then there's John Barnett's family friend who spoke to the New York Post recently, and he said he spoke to Barnett about two weeks before he died and said John just seemed really focused on the lawsuit and didn't seem depressed. But quoting from the Post, friend Bob Emery said that they had both recently lost their wives, himself more recently. He emphasized that it was Barnett who was making calls and checking up on him to make sure he was okay. Emery concluded that John had a good life going for him even with the problems at Boeing. Sadly though, John Barnett's wife, Diane Johnson, who also worked for Boeing, passed away in 2022 following an undisclosed illness. What you got ain't nothing new. This country's hard on people. You can't stop what's coming. So I just turned 59 recently, about the same age as John Barnett, and I was in the gym the other day. I do get there occasionally these days. But I must have spent about 25 of my 59 years as a young man in the gym. You know, the mind is a funny thing, because to this day, whenever I look in those giant gym mirrors, when I can even muster the courage to look, I'm always expecting to see this Max from 30 years ago. And every time I look in those mirrors now, I see the same strange old guy I don't recognize. 
It's odd. I literally can never get used to seeing that old man glaring back at me. I put a lot of miles on this old Buick. Many of those miles were good and some of which came with great tragedies as I'm sure millions of you can also relate to. But I bring this up not to show you old blurry pictures of me, but while researching this project, I looked at pictures of John Barnett in recent years. And you can just see the miles his battle for right with Boeing has taken on him. Don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying he looks bad or ugly. I'm just saying I see a man who has been through some tough battles. And I'm sure he proudly wore those scars just as I do and you do. But John always stood tall and strong all the way. Because although our government always assures whistleblowers to do the right thing and they will be protected and rewarded for their sacrifice, the problem is historically, especially whistleblowers, always seem to end up dead or exiled forever and forgotten by history. So who could blame people for their fear and silence by not speaking out? Oh, speaking of whistleblowers, by the way, if you've ever seen the Oliver Stone movie Snowden about Edward Snowden, indeed a whistleblower, if you squint real hard, you can see old Max's baby brother Marco in that film. I know if you blink, you'll miss it, but I just thought it was a good spot for a little nepotism shout out. He'll be signing pictures in the lobby after the show, by the way. But anyway, as I was saying, the point of companies crushing so-called whistleblowers who are trying to make our world, and in this case, the real life and death world of aviation a safer place, is that in reality, big corporations, including our US government, would rather you just do your job, take your paycheck and keep your mouth shut, or they will make your life a living hell, or do their damnedest to see that you die trying. There's a long, long list of either dead or broken former whistleblowers in history. So then why do it? Well, that's a great question. Because just like some people are born warriors who storm beaches from Normandy to the jungles of Vietnam and many others the world over, well, you kind of can't blame the rest for just keeping their mouths shut and collecting a paycheck. However, at least today, in the time in which we live, for better or worse, and usually worse, there is this thing called the internet and social media. I know many of you like me remember the good old boomer days before the internet or computers or cell phones or even VCRs or microwave ovens or even cable TV. Holy crap, I'm old. But back in the day, we only had three TV channels. Mm, PBS too, but that was just for Sesame Street. But today, for every tinfoil wearing hat conspiracy theorist living in their mom's basement, there are also many others who are fighting a righteous fight, standing on their feet and not dying on their knees. People like John Barnett and those who support and cheer people like John Barnett who many times stand like David alone against Goliath billion dollar megalopolises, governments and tyrants. And sadly too many times these modern day warriors still pay the ultimate price. So in my small way in this little video, I wanted to lend my voice of support to the John Barnett's of the world. I want to shine a light on all those who support and encourage and expose companies, even companies like Boeing, which I have loved my entire life. Until recently, that is. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today because I'm going to get him. So what exactly is a trigger? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the one on a firearm. You depress the trigger and a projectile is launched at faster than the speed of sound and ends a threat, provides a meal, and sometimes, well, much, much worse happens all too often. So regardless of the way John Barnett was dispatched, put the gun trigger metaphor on the side for a minute. Because there is a much more powerful trigger than that on a gun, because in our minds each of us possess a trigger. And we can use that trigger for mind altering greatness, but we can also use it for, well, evil. And most evil of all with that trigger, you never have to put a finger on a person to pull it. So let's take a look at the dictionary. To initiate or precipitate a chain of events, a scientific reaction, or a psychological process. 
and John Barnett was a righteous man who spent nearly 40 years of his life trying to make sure you, me, our children, mothers, fathers, people we love, and even people we don't are kept safe while flying in a tin can 35,000 feet above the earth at 650 miles per hour. And when his government urged people to speak up and speak out, John Barnett looked around and saw fellow employees who felt the way he did. But they were afraid. But afraid of what? Were they weak? No. They too feared what John feared the most. And this is the most important fear of all. Survival. Yet look where we are now. A close family friend of Barnett says he predicted he might wind up dead. That a story could surface that he himself. But he told her, don't believe it. He wasn't concerned about safety because I asked him, I said, aren't you scared? Which I, uh, no, I ain't scared. Um, he said, but if anything happens to me, it's not, there's no way. He loved life too much. He loved his family too much. He loved his brothers too much to to put them through what they're going through right now. Not According to the New York Post, a hotel employee said that the night before on the evening of March 8th that Barnett ate a quesadilla, drank a Coke, scrolled on his phone, and seemed fine. The employee said, I didn't think of him again until I heard the news the next day. Barnett was due to give a third day of deposition testimony in his bombshell lawsuit against Boeing the next morning, but never showed. Police discovered John on Saturday, March 9, at the urging of his lawyers, slumped over in his orange pickup truck with a silver gun still in his hand. The coroner initially noted the death as a self-inflicted wound, but said more tests are being done before a final determination. Police have made clear they are still actively investigating his death. Also, Barnett's car has been dusted inside and out for fingerprints, an unusual measure in these types of cases. And also from the Post, Boeing workers warned that John Barnett made powerful enemies before his suspicious end. Police report that he extended his stay at the Holiday Inn until March 8 and was caught on surveillance video leaving the hotel that morning. The police report also noted Barnett's driver's license was still in his room when he was found. Now I know I'm in the minority here and I'm not saying something nefarious did not take place. But it feels more like John just wanted to make sure they knew that was his room so he left his ID and possibly cared enough for some poor maid not to find him in that condition. Plus, if they have him on security camera walking to his truck stands to reason they would have caught the whole thing on video. So now we all just have to wait. However, consider this. 60 years after JFK, and still we can't seem to find the truth about what happened there either. And he was the leader of the free world. So in conclusion, here's my two cents. In this particular case, especially since the entire world has been watching Boeing closely the past few years, and with his lawyers promising to follow through with his case until the bitter end, an organized assassination of this magnitude would shutter Boeing forever. And I'm sincere when I say I still very much agree that it is a real possibility things are not as they seem. And Boeing is the U.S. government's biggest defense contractor, so there's that terrifying prospect. So who pulled the trigger? My answer, without a doubt, Boeing. However, more likely than not, not the trigger on the gun, but that most powerful trigger of all triggers, the trigger in a man's mind. So Boeing's fingerprints are all over this. Not only are Boeing's fingerprints going to be found all over the final chapter of John's life, but whether it was John himself or some covert hit squad or just some gang bangers they hired off the street, that point is really moot because like I said, the trigger in the mind of a beaten man is the most dangerous trigger of all. So that's why on that day, in that city, during that storm, in that riverfront vacation hotel, in that parking lot, in that pumpkin orange dodge, a man did a thing. Or maybe not. But either way, that man has nothing left to prove to any of us. As far as I'm concerned, John went out standing on his feet and not on his knees. A true American hero. And with that I say, Godspeed John Mitch Burnett, and Godspeed to all of you. Thanks for watching. You can't keep getting away with it!
He can't keep getting away with it.